there was a, a prayer request that was left in a uh, church prayer request box, and the, the pastor got it, and he was reading through it, and, well, this is what it said. Please pray for me. I've had two bypass surgeries, a hip replacement, new knees, fought cancer and diabetes. I'm half blind, can't hear anything quieter than a jet engine. I take 20 different medications that make me dizzy, winded, and subject to blackouts. I have bouts with dementia. I have poor circulation. I can hardly feel my hands and feet anymore. I can't remember if I'm 75 or 92. I've lost all my friends, but thank God I have my driver's license. <laughs> Y'all be careful driving home today, okay? You know there's people out there that shouldn't be driving. <laughs> Uh, but I'm glad that you're here today, that you drove here, that you got here, and that you are here for the Word of God. So let's, let's talk to our Lord before we read His Word. Oh, Holy Father, our great and gracious God, oh God, we love you and we are so excited to open your Word. Open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to what you have to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are to chapters 16 and 17. No, we're not. 15 and 16. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you're listening. Of Luke today. And really, I am so excited about this lesson. I mean, we've got in 16, we've got the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And then we get to 17, 16, and we've got rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, all of it, not in that order is in our lesson today. And so in chapter 15, before we get started, I want to back up one half of a verse to the very end of chapter 14, where Jesus has been uh, preaching and teaching along the way, and great crowds have joined him. And at the very end, the last verse says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then let's roll into chapter 15. I don't think there should even be a break right here. It says, All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching him to hear or to listen to him. Okay, so he's, there's a big crowd and he goes, Okay now, anybody who has ears to ears, let them hear. And who are the first ones to come up a little closer? It's the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, Tax collectors in first century uh, Israel were not popular people because they were Jews who worked for the Roman government to collect taxes and get a little extra cut off the top. So they were not, you know, the Mr. Popular in the neighborhood. <clears throat> they were looked down on as sinners. But then we've got the sinners also. And who are the sinners? Because, I mean, Really, is there anybody who's not a sinner? We're all sinners, right? But yet, in this context, context, it's talking about people who are outwardly living very immoral lifestyles, whether it's prostitution, uh, known uh, thieves, whatever it might be. These are people, you know, a lot, we're all sinners, but some of us can hide it pretty good most of the time, right? You know, we put on a smile and go out looking like we're the, just the best person in the world. God knows what's in our heart. But this is talking about people who everybody knew, oh, they are sinners. So, but they're the ones coming close to hear what Jesus has to say. Verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So here we've got four groups of people, not just the tax collectors and the sinners, but we've got the Pharisees and the scribes. And uh, <clears throat> they're, they're not so much gathering to listen to what Jesus has to say as to find fault with what he might say or do. That is their intent. Um, so... Uh, 
these uh, Pharisees, I want to remind you a little bit about who they are, the religious group, because I've talked about it, but it's been a long time ago. There's Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, Herodians, zealots. But the Pharisees were, uh, the name itself means separatist. Separatist. And their goal was to be separate, to keep themselves separate from any sin or any sinners. They... Uh, kept to the very strictest letter of the law. They um, divided people into two classes, basically the righteous and the unrighteous, the clean and the unclean, and they did not want to have anything to do with unrighteous, unclean people. They wanted to be separate from them. They were conservative. They were legalistic. They were meticulous with the external obedience uh, to the law and the traditions. And to them, the traditions were just as important and sometimes even more important than the laws. They advocated uh, a sh very strict observance to the Sabbath, which we've already seen a lot of that in, in Luke's gospel as Jesus healed on the Sabbath and the Pharisees criticized him for that. They... Uh, <clears throat> kept all the purity rituals. They were very careful about their tithing and their food restrictions. They believed in the books of the of what we would call the Old Testament, the books of law by Moses, the Torah, and also the books of the prophets. They adhered to all of those. They believed in that a bodily resurrection would come. They believed in eternal life. They believed in angels and demons. So they believed in a lot of what the Christians, you know, believe, but they were just more legalistic and strict about it. Now, not every Pharisee was like this. There were some really good Pharisees. We don't have their, all their names, but a couple of, of good ones were Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They were Pharisees. Later, when we get to the book of Acts, we find that Saul, who becomes Paul, was a Pharisee. And so it, at this time, Josephus writes that there were about 6,000 Pharisees in the land. So that's a lot of really religious people strictly keeping the law. And yet here they are with Jesus and they're, they're not wanting to hear and learn. They're wanting to find out what he might do, be doing wrong. The scribes were the professional copyists. They were the ones who would uh, make <clears throat> very careful copies of Scripture. They would also interpret the law. So we would call them lawyers today. Uh, but their, the law they handled was uh, from the Word of God. They taught and emphasized not just the law, but also the Jewish traditions. Many scribes were also Pharisees, so there's an overlap here. Uh, but they denied that Jesus had the authority to interpret the laws. So they didn't like it when he said, you know, something concerning the law, like he had authority. Because they didn't think he did, they thought they were the ones with the authority. So these next three uh, parables are going to be aimed somewhat at the Pharisees and the scribes. But before we s jump into these, I want to remind you of our key verse from the book of Luke. And I gave this to you on an outline back at week one, but I just want to remind you of it. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. That's from chapter 19, verse 10. And uh, it's an easy verse to memorize. I look at this as Jesus' mission statement. The Son of God has come to seek and to save the lost. And we're going to see examples of that in these parables. So first we have the parable of the lost sheep. So he, Jesus, told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. 
I want to stop right there at the word joyfully because joy, and then we're going to see rejoice and joy again throughout some of these passages. Luke talks more about joy and rejoicing than any of the other gospel writers. He is all about joy. He is about celebration. And, and, and as we already know, he's a man of prayer. Those are two things that he emphasizes. So here, when he finds it, he joyfully puts the lamb on his shoulders. And I was thinking about that, and I'm wondering, why did he put it on his shoulders and, um, and trying to picture that? And I thought, well, this is a lamb who's gotten lost, probably wandered away. He's not worried about the 99 taken off, okay? At the end of the day, the, the shepherd would come and uh, count the sheep and make sure they were all there. And here's one missing, so he's going to go. It's probably a small one if he's going to put it on his shoulders, right? And, and, and so if you've got it around your shoulders, you can hold on to, you know, two legs on each side, right? That's what I'm picturing. Whereas if you put it under your arm, those little legs might be kicking you in the side. So it's probably a smart way to carry a little lamb. But also, as you're carrying this little lamb, you can be talking to this little lamb. So that this little lamb can get familiar with your voice. Because in, in the book of the Gospel of John, it says, um, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They know, they know my voice. And so it's just, we, we know that the good shepherd in this is, is pointing to Jesus. So he puts it on its, his shoulders, verse 6, and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. So we have here <clears throat> this parable, and Jesus, we know, is the good shepherd. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so he has gone after this one little lost sheep. He's brought it back. He's rejoicing. He calls his friends to rejoice. But the cool thing is uh, he's equating this with one sinner who repents. What happens? There is joy in heaven, it says, uh, that there will be more joy in heaven over this one sinner maybe this one tax collector coming to repentance than over these 99 Pharisees who have just been doing outwardly the right thing all this time. So we see here that um, the good shepherd seeks and saves the lost. When the re sinner repents, there's joy in heaven and let's see what happens next with the parable of the lost coin. It says, or what woman who has 10 coins, your version may say 10 drachmas, which was a Greek coin equivalent to the Roman Darius, which is one day's worth of work. And so uh, she, if she loses one coin, what, um, she, this, let me start the beginning. Or what woman who has 10 coins, coins, if she loses one coin, does she not light a lamp, sweep the floor, and search carefully until she finds it? Now, what I am picturing here is maybe not a lost coin for myself, but if I've lost an earring, and you know, it's got to be there somewhere, and so you get a flashlight, and you're looking around, trying to catch a glimmer of it. You might need to sweep the floor, see if it sweeps up. You want to find that earring. You know, one earring is not good by itself. You need a set, right? I forgot both of mine today when I was dressing in the dark, okay? <laughs> but um, uh, she, she, when she finds it first night, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. So these first two parables stress <clears throat> the importance of a single 
sinful person repenting and coming to God. Um, a sheep and a coin cannot repent, right? So he adds that in to make sure we understand the connection that there's joy in heaven in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents, one who Jesus finds and rescues and brings in. Then we get to the parable of the prodigal son. Luke is the only one who tells the story of the prodigal son, and yet it's one of the most famous, well-known stories from the Gospels. Now, what is a prodigal? Okay, the definition is one who spends money, resources, or time freely, extravagantly, and foolishly. It can also be defined as one who has returned after an absence. And I would call it an unexcused absence, perhaps. <clears throat> okay, so verse 11, Jesus also said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the assets I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Okay, so normally you didn't get your inheritance until your father died. But here is this younger brother, younger son, and he wants it now. I want my money now. I want what I have coming to me. Can I have it now? Now, under the, the Jewish law, and this goes all the way back even to Genesis, the uh, firstborn always got a double portion. He's not the firstborn, but like, since there's two brothers, the assets would be broken into three parts, three equal parts, but the oldest son would get two, and the younger son is going to get one. I mean, if there were five sons, they'd be divided into six parts, and the oldest son would get two, and everybody else would get one. So you see how it works. He wants his part, even though it's not the biggest part. Um, and I the older son is getting that, so keep that in mind as we get into his story a little later in this. Um, but here are these two sons. They're, they're going to get their inheritance early. Um, it, they would have gotten it later anyway, but this younger son had the audacity to go to his dad and say, hey, I want mine now. I want it now. And so the father, you know, divides it, gives him his part, um, the father here is obviously God, and he's illustrating his love. His love allowed his son to rebel. He didn't try to stop him right here for this reason. He's a grown man at this point. Uh, the father knew that the son was making a foolish and greedy request, and yet he allowed him to go the course nonetheless. Verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. And after he had spent everything, a, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. So no doubt it was fun while it lasted, but the fun is done. And he is broke. And uh, verse 15 says, Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. Okay, he's Jewish, so he's gone to another country that's not Jewish because there are pigs there. He, he's not allowed to eat pork if he's keeping the Jewish law, but he shouldn't even be around them. And now he is working in the fields to feed pigs. Verse 16, he longed to eat his feed, fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. Goodness, what a poor state he is in because of a rebellious attitude, a greedy attitude. And verse 17 says, and when he came to his senses... Uh, some people think that that could be translated. And when he sobered up, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, Father. 
I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So his words here show that he is ready to repent. He recognizes that he has sinned against heaven, in other words, against God, and against his Father. And he is practicing what he's going to say when he shows up to his Father. He regrets it. He is showing true repentance here. Verse 20. So he got up and he went to his Father. But while the Son was still a long way off... His father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran. He threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. Okay, so the father could be, you know, upset, but no, as soon as he recognizes that's his son. You know, and your kids, you, you kind of know them even from a distance. You know the way they walk. You know their build. He spotted that was his son. You know, you can spot your kid from a ways off. It helps if they have a number on their jersey. <laughs> it really helps. But he recognized this was his son, and he goes running to meet his son. Verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So he didn't just think it when he was down and out. Now he's to his father, and he is going to repent. You know, it would have been easy to say, oh, he's running out to meet me. I don't have to say too much. But no, the first words out of his mouth were, you know, uh, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm not even worthy to be your son. Verse 22, but the father told his servants, quick, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. So this robe, the best robe, this is a family that obviously had some money. And so the best robe would have probably been a uh, purple linen robe because that showed wealth, that showed uh, status. And so he's, he's bringing his son back into the family he, he's giving him a ring. Perhaps it had the family insignia on it and sandals on his feet. Uh, the servants didn't wear sandals, just the sons. So he's like, let's get him some sandals. Then 23, then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. So they began to celebrate. So he, he, the son would have been happy to come back and have the status of a servant. But yet his father is like, no, no, no. You are my son. Get, the, get a nice robe. You know, get, a, get his ring. Get some sandals. Let's kill the fatted calf. Let's have a party and celebrate. My son was dead. And now he is alive. He was lost. And now he is found. The real point of this parable, um, we always think of the sun coming back, but I want you to know it's, it's teaching something to the Pharisees as well. All three parables um, show that there was something lost that is found, <clears throat> and the result of finding that. Finding the lost brings rejoicing. The opposite of what the Pharisees were doing. They were not happy when the lost were found, were they? No. He's eating with those sinners? Rather than rejoicing like, oh, people are turning to God. This is great. We're celebrating. They were jealous. Why does he want to hang out with them instead of us? Why, why is that a big deal? But we too should be rejoicing when a sinner comes to God, like the angels in heaven do. And I think we do that. I think we get very excited when someone turns from sin and turns to God. We are excited, but the Pharisees 
were not. They didn't see it that way. But let's finish this parable and see what the older son, um, who's kind of representing the Pharisees here, let's see what takes place with him in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he, the older brother, became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, I have been slaving many years for you or serving you many years, and I have never disobeyed your orders. And yet you never gave me a goat. I'm sorry, that kind of... You never gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends, I think he said it kind of pouting. And a goat wasn't even as good as a fatted calf. You know, hey, you're doing that for him. I never even got a goat. But when this son of yours came who devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. So we see his attitude is not, oh, I'm excited that my lost brother has been found, that he has repented, that he is back in the family. No, he is upset. He is jealous. He is sulking because his brother wasted his money and yet has been forgiven. Um, and, and the dad threw a big party for him. And that's kind of the attitude the Pharisees were expressing. The Lord receives sinners. He eats with them. The lost are found. The Lord cares about the least, the last, and the lost. And like we've already said today, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So now, how is the Father going to handle the situation with his older son here? How's God going to treat the Pharisees? Uh, son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So the attitude of the father is when the son gets mad, he doesn't chew him out. In fact, the son won't even come into the party, so the father goes out to meet him and pleads with him, it says, to come on in. He listens to the son story and then says, hey, you've always been with me. You've got whatever I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. So it's time to celebrate. It's time to rejoice. And that's his message to the Pharisees. You should be happy about these sinners coming to repentance. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's who we were. Ephesians, Paul writes this in chapter 2, verse 1 and following. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Yeah, we were all dead at one point. Dead in our sins and trespasses. And yet, 
We have been born again through Jesus Christ. We have come to new life, eternal life through him. We've been saved not by being good, not by being a good Pharisee, but by the grace of God. John 5, 24, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now, so often I think we think that when we come to faith in, in Christ, that we will have eternal life. But what this says is, we were dead, and then we came to life. And, and if we could have that verse back up for just a second, that last one. Uh, it says, uh, who hears and believes in him who sent me has eternal not life. Not will have. When you put your faith in Jesus, your eternal life has already begun. Has eternal life. And he does not pass into, or she does not pass into judgment, but we have passed from death to life. So our eternal life has already begun. It's going to get a lot better, y'all. Yeah. It's going to get a whole lot better once we leave this earthly body and get to our heavenly home. But uh, we were dead, now we are alive. So the Father here has shown several wonderful, like, tender expressions even to... Not just the younger son, but the older son. He moved toward him. He came out to his son. He didn't say <clears throat> to a servant, go get him and make him come on in, uh, back. No, he himself went there. Um, this is a picture of God coming to save even the hypocrites as well as the harlots. He goes and seeks the sinners. Second thing he did, he entreated him. He pleaded with him, just like the father woos us, appeals to us, pleads, yearns, doesn't command us to come to him, but invites us to come and receive a new heart. The father called him son. He was speaking endearly, endearingly to him. The father said, you are always with me. Everything that I have is yours. In other words, you've not been cast out. You were never cast out. You were never rejected. You were here all the time. I know that. You're my son. And then the father said, uh, yeah, everything I have is yours. Um, and there, so there's a tenderness here. And really, in this sense, at this time, he is showing that tenderness to the, even to the Pharisees who have been so judgmental and critical. He is showing them a picture through this older son that the father still cares about them. Even though they've been, you know, all worked up and upset, he still cares about them. He's come to save them as well. Um, <clears throat> now we get to chapter 17. 16. I don't know why I keep wanting to call 16, 17 today. <laughs> Next week, we're covering chapter 17. <laughs> okay, we get to the parable of the dishonest manager, and this seems to be a different occasion now. And uh, here's Jesus is teaching his disciples, and um, there's a group of Pharisees also listening in on this one too. This is one of the trickier uh, parables in the Bible. Uh, scholars struggle with it, and I'm not a struggle. I'm not a scholar, so I super struggle with it. But I'm, we're going to go through it and try to unpack it here today. All right, verse 1. Now Jesus said to his disciples, there was a rich man who received an accusation that his manager or steward was squandering his possessions. So he called the manager in and asked, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be my manager. Uh-oh. So this is like his head guy of the money, the CFO. <sighs> Come in, give an account. You're getting fired, but I want to know what you've done with everything. 
So the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig. In other words, do manual labor. I'm too ashamed to beg. I, I know what I'll do so that when I'm removed from management, the people will welcome me into their homes. So he summoned each one of his master's debtors. How much do you owe my master? He asked the first one. And the, hundred measures of olive oil, he said. Take your invoice, he told him. Sit down quickly and write 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? A hundred measures of wheat, he said. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. So uh, the steward was in charge of everything that the master had, but it still belonged to the master. And uh, so in his waste, he had blown the master's money, but he's going to go and try to make friends with people that owed the master money. Hey, I'm cutting your bill down 50%, 20%, whatever. And then when he gets fired, he can go back to these people and go, hey, remember how good I was to you? <laughs> remember how I did that little favor for you? I can use a favor now. So he's bargaining with these, with these people. And... Uh, uh, you know, it, but he's going to have to give an account of his stewardship. We're all going to have to do that at one point. We're going to have to give an account of our lives. Uh, Charles Spurgeon noted that each one of us will have to give an account of our stewardship regarding our time, our talents, our substance, and even our influence. Interesting. Interesting. So here's this manager. He knows he's in trouble. The audit's made. The accounting's done. He knows he's guilty. He knows he's blown it. He's wasted his master's good. He knows he's too old and frail to go digging ditches. He's too embarrassed to go begging for money. So he calls in favors from um, associates here. And what happens in verse 8? The master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd than the children of light in dealing with their own people or their own generation. So he's saying ungodly people show wisdom when they provide for their future. And sometimes they show more wisdom than believers do, than the children of the light in how they handle money and circumstances. Um, and, and not just that, in how we handle things of more value like setting up our treasures is not here on earth, but in heaven. Verse 9, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of worldly wealth, unrighteous money, so that when it fails, they may welcome you into eternal dwellings. <clears throat> so here is where it gets a little hard to, to understand in a sense, right? Why is this guy being commended for his shrewdness? Um, why wouldn't, the, why would, and his actions, why wouldn't the Lord just, uh, you know, say, he, you're going to be without, you're going to be punished. But we have to remember that uh, the money that you have within your responsibility where God places you can be used wisely, can be accumulated, and then it can be used for blessing other people. It can be used to store up treasures in heaven. Jesus in Matthew 10, 16 says, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So don't be just wise, but be innocent in how you do it, not like this guy was not totally innocent. The, the wealth of this world may not last even in this life, and it sure isn't going to heaven with us or hell. It's staying here. So, yeah, it's okay to accumulate, but not for the sake of just accumulation and storing it up in storehouses on earth, but to store up treasures in heaven, helping the, the last, the least, the lost, the abused kids, the needy families, the missionaries, and so forth. Verse 10, whoever is faithful in a little is also faithful in much, and whoever is unrighteous in very little is also unrighteous in much. 
So if you have not been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with what is genuine? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters since he will either since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So uh, I think there's four things that we can learn from this parable. Um, first of all, our resources belong to God, not us. He owns everything to begin with, uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, Psalm 24, 1 tells us. So it's not our resources, it's his. Second thing, money can be used for good or evil. Choose good. Choose good. Um, third, money has power. Use it wisely. Fourth, use resources to foster faith and obedience. By doing that, you are laying up treasures in heaven. Then we get to uh, another thing about learning a little bit more about the Pharisees. Verse 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money. So not only did they love to keep the law and stay away from the unclean, from the sinners, but they loved their money. And they were listening to all this and scoffing at him. Can you imagine? He told them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the light of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly admired by people is revolting in God's sight. So they love money and, and God knows it. He knows, he knows where your priorities lie, where your loves lie. He, he can see it. And so he's, um, Jesus is, you know, saying, well, you justify everything you do in the sight of others, but God knows the truth. God knows the truth. Verse 16, the law and the prophets were until John, being John the Baptist. So, Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God has been proclaimed and everyone is urgently invited to enter it. So John the Baptist is kind of the dividing line between the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the New Covenant, the New Testament. He's the dividing line because he is the forerunner to the Messiah. So before John, it was all prophecies leading up to Jesus. And then we've got John the Baptist, the forerunner, and then we've got Jesus. And so he's kind of, John is the dividing line. And uh, it says, since him, the good news of the kingdom of God has been proclaimed. And haven't we seen that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, <clears throat> so far that John came preaching repentance and proclaiming the kingdom of God is near, and then the kingdom of God is here when Jesus stepped onto, into the scene. Um, and who is invited to enter it? It said, everyone is urgently invited to enter enter it. So even the Pharisees, even the worst sinners, everyone is invited to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 17, but it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter in the law to drop out. <coughs> so the kingdom of God is being preached, but heaven and earth um, will pass away, but not one little part of the law is going to fail. Everything will be fulfilled. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, uh, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. <coughs> Excuse me. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, thank you, not the smallest letter or one stroke of, the, of a letter will pass away from the law until all these things are accomplished. And then in Matthew 24, 35, it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So he didn't come to abolish the law, to throw out the law that these Pharisees were so much into, but he's proclaiming, 
It's here. What, what, what was taught all the way up to John and through John is now happening, and you are urgently invited to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 18. Everyone, you know, this seems to be just kind of thrown in in the middle of everything, and I don't know why it's right here, but it is. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. Everyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. And then he goes into an affair, uh, another story. So um, in Matthew and in Mark, there, were, there was more about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And so I'm not going to go into a long thing about it right now. Uh, but it's important not to just take one verse like verse 18 and build a whole doctrine or a whole theology on marriage and divorce and remarriage based on one verse. It's better to look at the entire context of the Word of God and know that, yeah, God created man and woman. It was his desire for them to stay together. Uh, God does not like divorce, but there are reasons for divorce. Adultery is one that's mentioned here um, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and in Matthew 19, Jesus talks about it and says sexual immorality. So not just adultery, but any kind of sexual immorality is grounds for divorce. Um, Paul adds in 1 Corinthians 7 that desertion by an unbelieving spouse is also reasons for divorce. Uh, the remarriage, um, I know j churches teach different things on that. I will just say my uh, opinion from what I've studied and read and how I understand it, and you don't have to agree with me, um, is that if there were biblical reasons for your divorce, then, there are, then you are free to remarry. That's, that's how I see it. I'm not going to you know, argue if you believe otherwise. If you want to talk to me later, I'll explain how I came to that conclusion, and it wasn't easy, all right? But that's, that's uh, the, the conclusion I've come to. Um, let's keep rolling. The rich man and Lazarus story. Okay, so in this story, it's first for us to know a couple of things more about the Pharisees. Uh, they believed that if you had a lot of money and that's what they wanted, right? We just saw they loved money. If you had a lot of money, you were righteous. God had blessed you because you were so good. If you didn't have but a little money or no money, you, were, must, you must be a sinner. You were unrighteous. God's not blessing you because you're not good enough. So that's their mindset. Then we get to this story about a rich man and a poor man. It does not call this a parable. The others, it says, you know, like it calls them parables. This one is not called a parable. The, the poor man has a name, Lazarus. No names are given in any of the other parables. So, so we think this could be a true story or possibly. Um, let's read it. Verse 19. <clears throat> There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. But instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. So just picture the contrast here of this rich, wealthy man living lavishly. He's in a gated community. He's got all that he wants to eat, and there's a beggar at the gate. He's pitiful. Not only is he poor, but he is covered with sores. And he's thinking, if I could just have what the dogs get, just what falls off the table. But instead, the dogs are getting those scraps, and then the dogs are coming out and licking his sores. So this is a great con contrast of these two people in a very pitiful situation for Lazarus. Verse 22, one day, 
the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom or basically to paradise, to heaven, to where Abraham is. And Abraham is described as the father of the faith of the, of the, of the Jews and of, of Christians. He is the father of our faith. And he is described in Hebrews 11 as a man of faith. And so that's a good place to go, right? So he was awful here on earth, but here this poor man died and got an angel escort to heaven. What could be better than that? What could be better than that? By contrast, the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out. So he's Jewish because he's calling him Father Abraham. He called, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. So a complete reversal of fortunes for these two men. Now the rich man is in agony, torture, and he's calling out for help. Verse 25, Son, Abraham said, Remember that during your life you received good things just as Lazarus received bad things. But But now he is comforted here while you are in agony. Besides all that, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you so that those who want to come over from here to you cannot, neither can those from there cross over to us. So there's no changing places. Father, he said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house because I have five brothers to warn them so that they won't also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. And truly, you can read the Old Testament, it doesn't have to be just the New, to know that for unbelievers, there is a place of punishment where you will go. He's saying, I'm not going to send him, just tell him to read Read the scriptures. Read Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. Verse 30, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he told them, If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. And we know that came to be true because so many, even after Jesus rose from the grave, would not believe. And still today, there are people who will not believe that Jesus rose from the grave. So this rich man had used his wealth only to please himself, to live lavishly, not to help the poor. And then the poor man who had cried out for help, when death came, everything changed for him. Now... The rich man did not go to hell because he was rich, and the poor man did not go to heaven because he was poor. It was a lack of faith on the behalf of one and faith on the behalf of Lazarus. Um, The rich man died, was buried, his soul immediately went to Hades. Lazarus, when he died, he immediately received an angel escort. Um, These bodies don't last forever. Being rich and powerful cannot save you. You can call out for help after you die, but after you die, the decision's already been made. And um, heaven is not our default destination. Too many people think, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to put it off. I'm not, I'm not even sure there is a heaven and a hell. I'll just deal with it. If it happens when I'm die, I'll deal with it then. No, I mean, heaven is not your default destination. 
hell is. And hell wasn't even made for people. Hell was made for Satan and his demons. And so we don't have to go there. We do not have to go there. The common fallacy is asked, well, how can a God of love consign a person, send a person to eternal hell? How can that happen if he's a God of love? The fallacy is, first of all, the God of love that we serve does not send you to hell. In fact, the God of love that we serve loves you so much that he sent his very own son to die in your place and to die in my place through a most gruesome, horrific, painful, shameful death so that you would not have to go to hell. Remember, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And we forget to read 17, and it's just as important, maybe even more so. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Peter's writing this because people said, what is taking Jesus so long to return? He said he was coming back. It's been 30 minutes. (laughs) And he's saying he's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is being patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. So that's what God desires for all of us. And so perhaps today you're sitting here and you are unsure of your eternal destination. Maybe you've heard this and you think, you know, I, I feel dead inside. When you were talking about we are dead in our sins and trespasses, I don't feel alive. I feel like something major is missing in my life. Maybe, Maybe it's Jesus. Maybe it's Jesus. It's not about going to church and being religious. We see that in the Pharisees. It's about Receiving Christ into your life, into your heart, trusting in him, repenting of sins. Um, It's as simple as ABC. A, admit you're a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us are sinners. And that the payment for sin is death. But the gift of eternal life is for those who believe in Christ Jesus. So we need to believe in him, believe in Jesus. For as many as believed him and received him, he gave them the right to be called the children of God. And then see, confess Jesus as Lord of your life. Believe it in your heart. Confess it with your mouth that Jesus died for your sins that he rose from the grave and you will be saved if you believe that. Don't leave here today without putting your faith and trust in him. I'm always available to talk to after the lesson. Um, I don't assume that just because you're in Bible study, you're saved. I mean, I'm looking at you, y'all look saved. Everyone, I see a little glowing angel. <laughs> Don't be so close and yet miss it. Because you never know when your day is coming. Someone this morning told me her, her nephew last week was helping a neighbor take down a tree and a big piece of equipment 
fell on him and killed him. Do you think he got up that morning thinking this is my last day? No. I'm not trying to be a downer and I'm not trying to scare you into salvation. Well, maybe I am. <laughs> I'd rather scare you into salvation than, than have you go miss it all. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, thank you that you have made a way for us sinners to be saved. For us to be born again, come alive into eternal life. Thank you for paying the price for our sins. Even though you were innocent, perfect, you paid the price in full. We thank you for that, oh God. I pray that if any are in this room or, or are listening online, if they don't know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today will be the day of their salvation. I pray that with all my heart, oh God. In Jesus' name. Amen.